Hidden in the busy neon-lit streets of Tokyo City, the jazzy, moody atmosphere of a small bar is overshadowed by the ever-so-slight sense of danger. After a night of drinking, Detective Taki Renzaburo finds himself at the apartment of a beautiful woman he's been eyeing. As they share a long, passionate evening of romance and intimacy, Detective Taki's seemingly perfect dream quickly turns into a nightmare. This is Wicked City. And it was the film that introduced me to the beautifully brutal world of anime director Yoshiaki Kawajiri. If you're a fan of old adult anime, then it's likely you've seen some of Kawajiri's work, and you're already familiar with the aspects of his art that make it so iconic, and yet controversial. From depictions of ruthless explicit violence to themes and imagery that has been referred to as hyper-masculine, Kawajiri's work feels determined to leave an impact on its audience. To properly convey what captivated me so much about his movies, I decided to focus on three of his feature films that I believe best capture the allure of his work. But first, a quick backstory. After graduating from Yokohama High School in 1968, young Yoshiaki Kawajiri was eager to find a way to turn his passion of drawing into a full-time career. His plan at first was to enter the comic or manga industry, but things quickly changed once he discovered the world of animation. In an interview with MatrixFans.net, he states, My first brush with the animation world came about because I thought that learning animation would be a good way to improve my skills as a comic artist. Once I realized the power of combining moving visual and sound, I decided that's what I wanted to concentrate on. Kawajiri started his career at the Japanese animation studio Mushi Production, where he would work as an animator, animation supervisor, as well as doing character design and art direction type work. He started off working on in-between animation on projects like the 1969 television series adaptation of the manga Dororo and the 1970s adult-oriented fantasy film Cleopatra, then later moving on to key animation on Tomorrow's Joe, New Moomin, and other projects. Kawajiri was one of the last animators to work at Mushi Production before its initial closure in 1973, and a year before the company would officially shut down, Kawajiri, along with Masao Mariyama, Osamu Desaki, and Rintaro, founded the animation studio Madhouse. Madhouse started off as an outsourcing unit for TMS Entertainment, with their first project being Aim for the Ace in 1973. Kawajiri had his first directing credits with episodes of the 1976 anthology series Manga Sekai Mukashi Banashi, and continued to work as key animator on projects such as Barefoot Gen, later getting his first feature-length director credit on the 1984 movie Lensman Secret of the Lens. The film was co-directed by him alongside the more experienced Hirokawa, and was based on the Lensman novels by E.E. E. Smith. The movie was mostly viewed as a weak attempt to ride the coattails of the success of Star Wars, ironic considering that the original Lensman novels were apparently a source of inspiration for George Lucas's Star Wars films. By 1987, Kawajiri had taken part in directing two major Madhouse productions. The first was a short that was part of an anthology film called Neo Tokyo, also known as Labyrinth Tales. The film consisted of three short stories based on the works of Japanese science fiction writer Takuma Yumura. It's here that Kawajiri had his first experience creating a dark world, which would influence his taste in future projects. And it's with this film that we begin to truly see his iconic visual style. However, it was his next project that became his first true big break. Danger lurks in the streets of Tokyo. Detective Taki Renzaburo and his demon partner Makie, two operatives of a secret police force called the Black Guard, are charged with protecting a diplomat who holds the key to peace between both their worlds. After The Running Man, Kawajiri was tasked to adapt Hideyuki Kikuchi's The Black Guard, the first novel in the Wicked City series, and seeing that this project had a similar dark tone, he was excited to work on this new endeavor. After handing him the original story, they gave him free range to do with it as he sees fit. He had such creative liberty that he didn't even meet the original author until after the movie was completed, but as it turns out, they both had very similar approaches to their work. 
His creative tastes and mine are very similar. Our tastes matched each other, and Mr. Kikuchi was very happy with the end result. The movie was originally supposed to be 35 minutes long, working as a short film rather than a feature. However, after completing half of the movie, Kawajiri was suddenly told to extend the runtime to 80 minutes. A risky decision for sure, and the producers were aware of it, with one of them telling Kawajiri, if you don't think you can do it, you don't have to. But Kawajiri thought it would be more exciting to make the story longer, and ended up adding new scenes in the beginning, middle, and end of the film. And even though Wicked City was in production after the Running Man short for New Tokyo, it ended up being released first. You just don't know when to quit, do you? You got it. In the 1980s, anime was in a period of experimentation, where pushing boundaries and exploring mature and unconventional themes were common, and Wicked City is a prime example of this. From its cosmic horror-inspired action to its borderline pornographic sceneries, it's no wonder that my first exposure to the film left quite an imprint on me. What the hell is even that? Though the film had a theatrical release in Japan, it is classified as an original video animation, or OVA, which are Japanese animated films and series made specifically for a home video release. And I'm assuming that's what helped it have loose restrictions on its themes and content. It's also no surprise that the aspects that make the film stand out are also what causes it to receive much criticism. It doesn't help either that the story itself is very cliched and takes itself too seriously, with the plot getting a bit convoluted with its end goal and how it got there. Even though the topic of sexual violence was used for shock value, it's not as if it didn't have a purpose within the plot. In the story, both main characters experience a form of assault, but manage to find consolation within each other and overcome it. Sort of. I think that was the point at least. Listen, this is written exactly how you'd think old horny Japanese men would write their romantic fantasies. <laughs> But despite it all, Wicked City is just too interesting of a viewing experience for me to dismiss. The old school high level of details on the characters are something that I miss when watching modern anime. I love the designs of each character, from the strong jawline and muscular build of Taki, to the slim figure and smoky eyes of Makie as well as the many horrifying creatures, tentacles, and tendrils. Both main characters are beautiful badasses, but I do wish we got to dive deeper into who they are as characters. The character of the diplomat was my least favorite though. He is the generic depiction of the perverted small old man with hidden powers that you commonly see in anime, and he's too explicit for my taste. He's like Master Roshi, but with an even worse history of sexual harassment. <laughs> the movie feels like an animated cross between Blade Runner and John Carpenter's the thing. The animation is very fluid and dynamic. What really stuck with me ever since my first viewing was the film's atmosphere. The mysterious and dangerous tone that exists throughout the film perfectly builds up the moments of intense action. To help establish the atmosphere, the film utilizes harsh shadows and stylized lighting. A blue neon color grade was also used throughout the film, which makes it look and feel otherworldly. To create a mysterious atmosphere and cold feeling, I used blue, uh, which also looks more vivid when transferred to video. It looks it's clear and beautiful and it creates strong contrast when combined with black. Wicked City later had a western release in 1993. Critical reception of the film was unsurprisingly mixed, especially when it became available in the west, with one critic from the Los Angeles Times stating that the film epitomizes the sadistic, misogynistic erotica so popular in Japan, both in animated and comic book form. Can't say you haven't got an opinion. Despite that, Wicked City has gained cult status, with it attaining international recognition as well as being cited as highly influential in both the cyberpunk and horror genres. After Wicked City, Yoshiaki Kawajiri continued working as key animator on other projects, as well as directing another adaptation of Kikuchi's novels, with the OVA film Demon City Shinjuku. This leads me to the second film I want to focus on, and that's the 1993 movie Ninja Scroll. In Edo period Japan, a skilled ninja warrior named Chubei Kibigami reluctantly joins forces with a female ninja named Kagero and an old spy named Dakawan to battle a group of supernatural warriors with extraordinary powers called the Eight Devils. Fun fact, I first learned about this film's existence from a fan-made animated music video for Cradle of Filth's Hallowed Be Thy Name. 
Ninja Scroll used the novels by Futaro Yamada as its main source for inspiration for both its story and style. Kawajiri had an interest in ninjas since he was a child, and he had the idea for Ninja Scroll right after finishing his work on Wicked City. Though at first, he didn't know if this would be suitable as a business project for the company, as he simply wanted to make a ninja movie for the audience to enjoy. However, the people at Studio Madhouse ended up encouraging him to make the film. I had fun making Ninja Scroll. The thoughts, I want to do this, how can I make it more exciting were constantly on my mind. I think the audience can feel that. Like Wicked City, Ninja Scroll had a similar set of main characters. The skilled male protagonist, the female partner with powers, and the small old man that's more skilled than he actually looks. But at least this time he isn't a complete pervert. <laughs> I personally think Kawajiri does a better job here with the storytelling than he does with Wicked City. Yes, it's still basic and by the numbers, with the generic hero fighting one villain after after the other until reaching the final boss like a video game, but you do see an improvement in the story's structure. All the characters manage to play off of each other nicely, and each villain managed to leave quite a mark with their presence, despite some having less screen time than others. Uh, you can't be serious. Who'd want to fight monsters like him again? Out of the three main characters, Kagero was the most interesting. I'm Kagero of the Koga Ninja Team. Other than being a ninja, she was also her clan's official food taster, and due to ingesting too many toxins, anyone she kisses or sleeps with ends up being poisoned. Because of that, she's distant and is seen as expendable by most of her clan. Till he returns, I belong with you. A member of your Koga Ninja. Being a Kawajiri film, it's no surprise that violence and sex as well as sexual violence are prominent themes. And in Ninja Scroll, they were quite interesting aspects of the narrative. Adding to Kagero's trait of maintaining a tough act but deep down inside is hurt to the point where she feels like her life has no value. It's too bad though that the film overuses assault as a plot point and places that felt unnecessary. Which is a shame because Kagero's character showed that she had much more to offer than simply being a victim in need of rescue. That being said, she did display many instances of badassery and held her own as a fighter. Jubei also showcased his skills and charisma throughout the film, and was very fun to watch. And I enjoyed the character of Akuan as the slimy little manipulator that manages to get the main crew together and cooperate for a common goal. My name is Dakuan. Let's be friends. The animation is dynamic with the characters feeling solid, three-dimensional, and yet very fluid. The fights are beautifully choreographed, having strong and violent kinetic hits with each impact being shown in brutal detail. The character design of every villain managed to make them stand out and look unique. From a hulking figure with stone-like skin, swinging a giant two-bladed weapon, to a woman that has snake tattoos that come to life, to even a hunchback with the power to control bees stored in his hump. Fly, my pretties! Fly! Fuck this shit, I'm out. They all managed to leave a lasting impression. My one gripe is that I wish we got to explore the past relationship with the main villain Genma and the main character Jubei, because it felt like we had much more to learn to truly appreciate their final battle. But on the other hand, keeping a sense of mystery surrounding Genma did make him feel more intimidating by the time he steps out of the shadows. I think the weakest part in the story for me is that the romance between the two main leads isn't believable. It's not that strange that the romance also falls into the category category of old horny Japanese male fantasy, since the entire film and its action is hyper-masculine. And don't get me wrong, the whole dynamic is fun to watch, but I also find it funny to see Kagero be like, I'm tough, I don't need him, but I want him. And Jubei be like, I don't need people like her, but I can fix her. And I'm just watching like, oh my god, just kiss already! And you know how I mentioned Kagero can't be intimate with another person due to the toxins in her body? Well, guess what? Kawajiri uses another elaborate plot point to encourage the main characters to get together. He did so by having Jubei get poisoned, with the only antidote being Kagero's toxins, killing poison with poison. If you truly want to save his life, then you must do it. That's the only way you will save him. I know that doesn't make sense, but nothing in this film is exactly realistic, so why bother complaining now? The point of this film is to be a bloody good time, and that's exactly what it was. Again, Kawajiri's films being this quote-unquote male fantasy is what many criticize, but what many others find appealing as well. These unrealistic facets of his movies are what make them a form of escapism. But the main leads aren't just bland self-insert characters, they do have personalities, but the viewers can still imagine themselves in their 
shoes? Where they dream that they're this heroic figure in a cold-blooded world fighting to save the helpless. Tough luck if you're a woman though. Ninja Scroll became popular in the West after receiving an English dub in 1995 and airing on MTV's Liquid Television blog that same year. The blog is known for launching a variety of different adult-oriented animations, such as Beavis and Butthead, The Max, and Aeon Flux. Just like many action-packed anime that became popular at the time, Ninja Scroll's animation surpassed what many Americans had witnessed with their animated media. The explicit nature of the film made it stand out and was appealing for many teenagers and older viewers. But I personally started to question, can I find more than simply escapism in Kawajiri's films? Well, this leads me to the third and final movie in his filmography that I want to focus on, that being Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust from the year 2000. In a dystopian future dominated by vampires, a young woman appears to have been abducted by one of these creatures. In desperation, her uncle hires a group of bounty hunters to find and rescue her. But complications arise as her father recruits another hunter to the mission, a half-human, half-vampire hybrid known only as D. Tell me your name. D. D's nuts. Ah! Got it! Based on yet another series of novels by Hideyuki Kikuchi, the film came about after demands for a sequel to the first adaptation from 1985 by both fans and Kikuchi himself. Kikuchi wanted a second attempt to make a Vampire Hunter D anime due to the first one looking too cheap for his taste. Seeing how Kawajiri had previously successfully adapted some of Kikuchi's novels and had developed a friendship with the writer, it's no surprise that he was the go-to choice to helm the making of this new movie. Kawajiri based the screenplay on the third novel in the Vampire Hunter D series. Unlike other anime films, the English soundtrack was recorded first, as Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust was made with the plans to have it released theatrically in America, which it eventually did, screening at over 12 theaters across the United States. This is the movie that I would consider to be Kawajiri's magnum opus, the piece of work that all his future projects would look back at as a frame of reference. In my personal opinion, Bloodlust marks the peak of Kawajiri's career, and to show why I think this film is so perfect in that respect, I want to recap how I feel about the previous two main movies. Wicked City had captivating tone and atmosphere, with great animation. The two main characters were likable and charming, and I really liked their designs. However, they left a lot to be desired in terms of who they are and how they developed. The villains and monstrous designs were interesting, but blended all together with only a few of them standing out here and there. And the issues that I had with the story might have also come from the need to extend the run time from 35 minutes to a feature length. Ninja Scroll had far more cohesive storytelling. The two characters here are charming, but also had improved character depth and development. In fact, unlike Wicked City, all of Ninja Scroll's villains managed to stand out in their design, though I didn't really care about who they were as individuals, and wished that we explored the past relationship of the main character and villain a bit more. However, in Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, every side character stands out, from their design to their every interaction no matter how little screen time they had. Every member of the Marcus Brothers, the bounty hunting group in competition with D, managed to have a great on-screen presence. Even though some didn't last that long, their interactions and chemistry between one another were delightful, and I genuinely didn't want to see any of them die. Rest in peace. Each villain had a creative look. Even when they had a generic power, they had a nice twist to it that made it stand out. For example, if you think about a werewolf, you'll have this familiar and traditional image in your head about this half-man, half-wolf being. The werewolf character in this movie, however, has this giant extra monstrous jaw emitting from their stomach. Even D himself has this sentient parasite that lives in his left hand, that can talk to him and has the ability to suck up any magical curse. Talk to the hand. The animation here looks cleaner than all of Kawajiri's movies that came before, and I know I literally just called the visuals clean. The overall look was purposefully made to appear dirtier, through the usage of film grain and jitter to emulate the look of old classic vampire movies. And believe it or not, I even liked the romance plotline between the kidnapped girl Charlotte and Baron Meyer. I complained previously that up till now, the romantic aspects of the stories are either not very convincing or 
convoluted. And it's not like the romance here is relatable, but it is effective. Their love story plays out like a Shakespearean tragedy, with Myers fighting against the very nature of his being to be with Charlotte, and her willingness to give up her very humanity, all for the sake of love. Yes, it is one of those stories that overly romanticizes the idea of forbidden love, but when it's done well, I do find myself invested, which is the case here. All the pain I've caused and all the agony I feel is nothing now. And you are everything to me, my love. Okay. However, I did find myself being mostly invested in the relationship between Dee and Layla, one of the bounty hunters with the Marcus clan. Throughout the film, you see them go from competitors to developing an interesting friendship. They manage to connect through their shared sense of loneliness and lack of feeling any self-worth or value, with Dee being this half-breed shunned by society and Layla being an orphan who witnessed her mother being stoned to death after she was turned into a vampire. Since we're both in it for the long haul, whoever dies first, the other one can come and bring flowers to their grave. I don't know why I should care about that, it's just I love flowers. And I don't think I'll be getting any. In fact, my only nitpick with this movie is that I wish we got to see more of their friendship. That being said, it all leads up to quite a heartfelt ending that gave me this teary-eyed smile by the time the credits started rolling. I just came here to keep a promise to an old friend of mine. She was afraid no one would mourn her death. I'm glad she was so wrong. Good job, you old horny Japanese man. Good job. Beautiful. Yes, beautiful. Kawajiri worked on many more series and movies before Bloodlust that I haven't mentioned, as well as continued working after the fact, most notably on segments in American anthology films such as The Animatrix and Batman Gotham Knight. Though nowadays he's unofficially retired and mainly works as a guest storyboard artist on many different anime series, Kawajiri's films have cemented themselves as iconic pieces of dark anime unique to the Golden Age era of the industry. With the vast change in today's market and audience sensibilities, the filmography of Yoshiaki Kawajiri is sure to attract viewers who are looking for that edgier content and more detailed style that they feel are rare to find in modern anime. Everything ends exactly as I have written it. Thank you all for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. And shout out to Forgotten Relics for helping out with this one. My name is Sammy and if you liked what you saw, make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe.